Welcome to ZCast, everyone. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. I'm with uh, Nabil Bukhari. You're the CTO of Extreme Networks. Uh, you're also a ZCast regular, so happy to have you back. <laughs> Zias, uh, it's always good to talk to you, my friend. And, uh, and how you been? I've been good. You know, it's uh, busy, busy, busy. As you know, Extreme end of the last year, we announced a lot of big things. Yeah. So we were super busy with that. Um, you know, good thing I got at least a few days off. <laughs> the well, the year's New starting years. up again. And so, now we're yeah. back at it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you're here at uh, CES. You were here last year as well. Yeah. Um, uh, why do you come to the show? It's a consumer show. Yeah. And uh, I know, you know, we've talked over the years about the consumerization of the enterprise. Yeah. Are you still seeing that as a trend? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the reasons... Um, there's two reasons why I come here. One is that obviously, you know, I speak here. I, you know, I, I typically have done that for four years now. But that consumerization of enterprise technology is you and I have been talking about it for like four years. Every yeah, year yeah. we talk about it. I actually think that it's becoming even more important and more meaningful, right? It's just, if you think about it, like, there are two big things on the enterprise side that everybody talked about in 2024 and will continue to talk about in, in 2025. First, obviously, is AI. Yeah. Right. Now, you think about AI, AI was first introduced in the consumer world. ChatGPT yes. was released to yeah. the consumers, not to the enterprise. And then we. In fact, even speech interfaces, things like that, <laughs> Alexa Siri, exactly. all consumer use first. So they were all consumer use. And then now what's happening is that as these technologies are coming into the enterprise side, the expectation of user experience, the expectation of its behavior and its interaction, they have all been set from the consumer world. Think about it. Every enterprise application, when they introduce their AI to that application, what did they do? They put a chatbot into yeah. it. Chatbots came from the consumer world. So yeah. that consumerization of enterprise technology and, and the shrinking of difference between them, I think it's only accelerating. Yeah, in fact, I know um, you know many of the sports leagues, things like that, have been experimenting with AI-generated commentary. Yeah. Uh, I use uh, the app Strava; it's got AI-generated commentary built yeah. into it now. And now, what I'm starting to see from the app vendors is they're building that kind of interface into their apps. So, if you think of even the collaboration tools, Zoom, yeah. tools like that. Yeah. Right, they'll give you meeting summaries, things like that, and I 100%. and I firmly believe that every application we use will eventually have some kind of chatbot-like interface. Hundred yeah. percent, right? Because think about it: that that's what the consumers expect. That's what they are now getting used to. And then, whether they are on the consumer side of the equation or enterprise side of the equation, they want the same things. Yeah. So, I predict that in another <clears throat> three, four, five years. The AI side of the equation, there will be no difference between the consumer world and the enterprise world, right? And yes, the only um, exception to that rule would be the data management side. But that's kind of like the underlying yeah. architecture. But from the, a user perspective. From a user perspective, there will be no difference. You know, they will be exactly the same. Yeah, and in, in fact, um, I, it's, it's got some fascinating implications mm -hmm. uh, because, um, you know, someone uh, said to me a while ago that what AI does is it, uh, democratizes insights, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if the internet democratizes information, yeah. AI democratizes insights yeah. and it lets, um, it, it lets the non-expert do yeah. what the expert did. And so yeah. if you think about, you know, if you're a, a salesperson and you want, or a sales manager and you want yeah. to pull, you know, sales analytics, typically yeah. you had to go to somebody to run yeah. those analytics for yeah. you. Yeah. Now you can just ask. Yeah. You know your Salesforce, perhaps. Yeah, who are, who are absolutely. My top three performing salespeople absolutely. based on margin or something, right? You know, on that note, and and, and I and I talked about that like a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, at one of the you know one of the speeches that I did, and it takes the same concept and broadens it a little bit. So think about it. what AI does is it reduces the difference between what you think and what you can do. Reduce the yes. Yes. Right? Because think about it, like we used to be like, oh, you know, anybody can have great ideas. But then it was like, oh, well, you need so much money and you need so much technology to do it. It was true for people. It was true for companies. But now, if you can think it, AI can help you do it, whether you're an individual or a small company or a startup or a mega trillion dollar company. And that is really exciting because I think that democratizes that hmm. creation phase and it it, it reduces that haves and have nots, you know, difference. And that's just so exciting because we are at the very, very start of this journey. So it will be really interesting to see what happens in the next like four or five years and what people will create out of it. Yeah. And I know another big topic that's gone 
in many ways along beside uh, AI is platformization. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, there's not an enterprise vendor out there that doesn't put in yeah. some kind of platform story, yeah. uh, story together. You, you guys rolled yours out. Yep. Is that another one that you see driven from consumer to enterprise? 100%. Yeah. And I think this is something that you and I talked yeah. about when we launched Extreme Platform 1. Um, the concept of platformization is really a consumer concept. Think like Apple. Think Adobe. Yeah. You know, think like Google suite of applications or whatever, right? They really all started from the consumer side. And this idea that I as a consumer can go into one place and get everything that I need, you know, that is the essential, you know, idea behind platformization. And then the fact that my experience expectations move with me, and like think about Apple ecosystem, your yeah. Apple ID, it's the same wherever you go, and you know, it has all the information about you and blah blah. So that is the concept behind platformization. And I would say absolutely platformization concept has come from the consumer world. And you know Zia, that we said that very openly that it's going to be the combination of platformization and AI that will truly unlock the potential of AI. Yeah. Because if every application has a chatbot, then you have siloed AI. Then you're gonna have to write chatbots on top of these chatbots that makes it work. And, and you know, like you will go from the world of there's an app for it to there's a chatbot for it, right? Yeah. But when you combine these things into a platform, essentially what you're doing is that you're combining the data in the platform. And it's by the way, I will tell you that it, will, it is a lot easier to govern and manage that data as a part of platform as opposed to across a multitude of applications. So once you do that, then when you apply AI to it, that truly unlocks the potential of it. So my prediction is, um, and not only our prediction, I mean, this is what we're doing at Extreme, is combining the two things together. And that's when some of these really interesting use cases that we've been thinking about that really become possible. I actually think the AI will actually <clears throat> separate true platforms because every vendor for a long time has said they're a platform, but yeah, when you yeah. look, it's a collection of products. That's what it is. Right? It, it's a bundle. It, because you can bundle them together and call yeah. it a platform, but that's more of a but, marketing but me, thing yeah, than anything. To me, yeah. what platform yeah. really is, if you think of the way you brought up Apple, the Apple ecosystem yeah. works, yeah. I can get a text message in one reply in another, 100%. I can move files, yeah. right? And so if the vendor platform isn't yeah. a true platform, yeah. to your point, their AI is not going to work. It's they're, not going to work. They're going to have, yeah. um, in yeah. fact, um, there's an expression in data sciences, yeah. right, that says good data leads to good insights. Yeah. Well, silos of data, to your point, yeah. lead to fragmented insights, yeah. right? And exactly, and, <clears throat> and there's, there's only that many million and billions of dollar people yeah. are going to invest in writing their emails better through AI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the use cases for AI have to have to evolve, and for that to evolve, it has to be married with platform. Otherwise, it will be a very limited use. It'll still be useful, but it'll be limited use, yeah. right? And at some point in time, and it's already started, and this is one of the reasons in the enterprise world, I go around and I talk to so many enterprises, and the first question they ask me about is AI, and the second question they ask me about is like, how do you determine the ROI for it? <clears throat> and that's what it is. So yeah, exciting time. And how do you answer that question, the ROI? Because yeah. in a lot of ways, I think, the ROI of AI yeah. isn't really an answerable question. It's yeah. like asking what the ROI of the internet is. Yeah. It just, it, it's something that you have to do yeah. because it's the way business will be done. And you, yeah. when customers ask you that, yeah. what's the ROI of AI? Do yeah, you, so, do you give them an answer? so my answer is that you don't figure out the ROI for AI, you figure out the ROI for the use case to which you apply AI. And that's the way, like for yeah. example, if I say, and I'll say a very simple example that everybody does, like, hey, um, everybody needs customer support. Right? There's no enterprise that cannot have customer yeah. support. And customer support costs a certain amount. And there's a certain customer expectation off of it, right? Now those things are set in the market. Like if you ask somebody like, hey, I want to start up a, a, a customer success or a customer support organization, they're very good formulas to know how much yeah. would it cost and stuff. But now if you apply AI to it, two things happen. How much cost have you reduced and how much customer experience have you improved? And those two things is your ROI for applying AI to that. Hmm. So it's really That's the ROI for yeah. customer success and not necessarily AI. And I think the more the organizations and the companies think about that, and you know, I've talked and I've written a lot about the ARC framework. That's what it is, that you classify your use cases into something that you want to accelerate, something that you want to replace, and something that you want to create new. Once you categorize your use cases in there, it becomes a lot simpler to determine the ROI for that. But if you say like, hey, 
we're going to use AI. What's the ROI for it? To your point, yeah. I'm a, what's the ROI of internet? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you couldn't do business without it. Yeah. So um, I want to shift gears here a little bit. I know that you just finished doing a talk on um, your one of the talks here at CES, yeah. and uh, it was titled, and it had kind of an interesting title, yeah. Do You Need a CISO? Yeah, do you need a CISO, yeah. Right? And uh, <laughs> I think everybody just inherently thinks yeah. yes, and it yeah. was targeted towards uh, smaller businesses. Smaller and medium businesses, yeah, not we, like large enterprises. Yeah, we typically yeah. maybe have them, don't have them. Yeah. Um, but what was your answer to that? I, I, yeah. uh, you know, I heard your answer, I was a little bit surprised. Yeah. So, <laughs> so tell our audience what your answer was, yeah. and do you, need, do you need a CISO? Um, well, here, here's the thing. Um, first, I want to caveat by saying that I know some great CISOs yeah. and they're doing some great job in there, so I don't want to offend my friends out there. Um, but I believe at a certain size of a company, or up to a certain size of the company, you actually it's counterproductive to have a CISO. And here's my argument. It's not that you don't need security. It's just that if you, at that size, if you take security and make it the job of one person or one exec, then what typically happens is that the rest of the exec says like, okay, it's not really my job, yeah. right? And it then translates into two, three things. One thing is, I mean, there's every company, wherever there is a CISO, there's animosity yeah. <laughs> against that organization, well, that's the job, right? right? So. <laughs> because that's the job. Yeah. The second part that happens is that um, then security becomes kind of a silo thing. And look what has happened. Even in the security industry, it has translated into products that are meant for that CISO and are not really connected to anything else in the enterprise. And we have created this overlay of technology and roles. Now, if you are a big enterprise, sure, just to coordinate those activities, you probably need a CISO. But if you are a small and medium enterprise, it's much better that everybody is doing the job of the CISO rather than separating it out of the CISO. So the way I think about it, to a certain level, it is counterproductive. But when you go beyond that level, it becomes an operational thing. Um, but even for large enterprises, man, security is not just a CISO's job. Security is a CTO's job. Security is a, a CIO's job. Security is a CEO's job. And security is a board's job. Yeah, you can't assign it to one person and then just say, hey, you are responsible for that. So, so that was my argument around there. So the counter argument to that, to what you said, mm -hmm. is that if it's everyone's job, then it winds up being nobody's job. Yeah. So in a way, the CEO almost need to drive, needs to drive that security mindset down. 100%. Because if they don't, then the rest of the organization will. Yeah. I mean, the same argument is like, as you know, there's a lot of like new upcoming chief AI officers. Yeah. I also think that too is well-intentioned, but it's probably going to backfire because the impact of AI, just like security, is so massive that it really needs to be driven by that top person, which is the CEO. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have people working on AI and security. Yeah. That's still there. You might still have departments. But I just believe that something like security, something like AI, it is so broad spread that you can't really assign it to a single exec. And so, so I think it's more of a human argument rather than a technology argument there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, uh, just, you know, a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, so looking ahead, since you are the CTO of Extreme, yeah. as much as you can talk about future, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In trouble. Yeah. Uh, you just announced uh, Extreme Platform One. Yeah. Uh, what's next for the company? What's yeah. what's coming? How do you build on that? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> right. you know we, we there there are some exciting times happening at Extreme here. So we just announced Extreme Platform One, which. Um, as we talked about earlier, which is in the true sense of the word, a platform and not just packaging of our products. Uh, I think right, right. now- Right, and you guys worked on that for a long time. We worked yeah. on that for oh, so more than two years. So you didn't cobble together a bunch of stuff yeah, and say, yeah. here's your platform. Uh, it took a while mm. to get there because um, the thing is, um, if you are a product company and you build products, you build like software products, you build applications, Moving to building platforms is a complete rehaul of your mentality, your organizational structure, your behaviors. I think mean, it's almost like a rebirth of a, of, a, of a company. So platformization is not just about like, oh, these were my five applications, now I'm gonna put one license on it and call it a platform. That's packaging, that's not platform. So, and you have been with us on this journey, so it took us a little while. So I think our focus right now is very much in bringing it out, getting it in the hands of our customers, help them transition. Um, the second, there are a couple of other big things that will happen. They are related to AI. Now we announced Extreme AI Expert as part of the platform, yeah. which is 
Um, and as you, you really know, had to have the platform do AI expert, Exactly, right? yeah. because AI, we, and this is very interesting, we refuse to introduce a chat bot in our applications. Everybody had it and we were like, no, it's not useful. We are going to convert it into a platform we just did. And then we applied AI to it. So it is not a chatbot. It is available in every single workflow that you can potentially do in the platform, right? Mm -hmm. So that has happened. Uh, there are a couple of other thoughts after that. And that will really kind of, if you, if you, if you, and you have talked to me about this a lot. So if you notice, that as you apply AI to use cases, then AI needs to be packaged, priced, searched, and made available in a different way. <laughs> uh, I know I'm, I'm purposely trying to be vague. I'm not trying to give yeah. away all the roadmap, but, uh, but we believe that we'll do something around that which will revolutionize that whole space, right? Uh -huh. um, and. Um, you know, friend. you will be there at our Extreme Connect, yeah. our user conference. Yeah. So, you know, you will be the first one. So that is in... In May. Paris in, in May. May. So yeah. May 19th, that is in Paris. And uh, that is our big user conference. We do it every year. We do one year in US and one year in Europe. You know, we're close to our European friends. Um, and it's going to be very exciting because not only that we will continue to do more things on the platform one, uh, but we will pretty much revolutionize the way you think of AI in the context of your entire business. So stay tuned, stay All tuned right. on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Nabil, so to wrap yeah. things up, uh, yeah. CES, more con consumerization, the enterprise is still alive and kicking, yep. driving AI, driving platform. Yeah. Uh, if you're a small business, you don't need a CISO. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to start a fight here. <laughs> yeah. and, but, uh, and but, but if you're a small business, uh, you should consider the risks and the advantages of separating that role out and then decide for yourself, obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah. And then uh, and uh, to learn more about what you're doing, come to Extreme Connect in Paris. In, yeah. Uh, it's a lovely time, too. Yeah, come May is a good time to be yeah. in Paris. So, yeah. uh, all right, anything else you want to add? No, yes. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I think the next one we'll do in Paris. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so have a great rest of the yeah. show. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for those of you watching, uh, on behalf of Nabil Bukhari, CTO of Extreme, I'm Zias Caraval from CK Research, and thanks for watching. Uh, give us a like and hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time in the next episode of Zcast. Thanks, Nabil. Thank you.